Hey folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorial. So, uh, a bit of an exchange on James Elmsley's um, a Facebook wall, basically talking about um, falchions. And um, so, first thing I should point out is, so James is one of the experts. Is I mean, the leading researcher, basically, on on falchions, on single-edged medieval swords. But um, I will talk more about James and his typology, and maybe one of his swords in a future video. So, I'm not going to bang on about James right now, but. So most of you who watch my channel will be aware of the fact that I have this falchion, okay? Now this isn't based specifically on one historical um, surviving one. Uh, James has made a, a sort of a, a more accurate replica, certainly in terms of the size and weight and balance and all that kind of stuff, of uh, the Cluny falchion, okay, which is in Paris, uh, of which is one of the inspirations for this sword. But I should note that the Cluny falchion is a much smaller sword than this. In terms of the size and proportions, this is about as big as this type of falchion get. And that's kind of what I wanted. I wanted something that was fun. And this was made by Paul Bins, and the blade is somewhat similar to the Conyers falchion, which obviously is English. This style of falchion really was popular in the middle of the um, middle of the 13th century. So we're talking about the 1200s, okay? They were around for maybe late 80 to 100 years at most, um, but they were one of the earliest type of falchion that appear, and they appear in the 13th century. Why do they appear at that time? Well, that's a very good question and a very something that I would probably explore in a separate video, um, but. My opinion is the 13th century is really when you're starting to get heavy mailed um, people, um, so knights we could call them, but probably a lot of them were, should be called men at arms rather than knights because obviously you have to be knighted to be a knight. And um, so uh, that could be a factor. Um, the fact that you're starting to get um, large levied uh, bodies of, um, of infantry um, at that time, there's, there's various things going on in the 13th century which could lead to the um, sort of the growth of popularity of this type of sword. Um, but what I really want to say is that a lot of people in the modern world, and I have spoken about this in previous videos, but it seems that it's not sticking. So I need to throw some more of this at the wall and hope that gradually this, this, these uh, corrections to misconceptions will start to spread and people will start to, to uh, know some of the facts. Okay, the, um, These falchions are often recreated in the loosest possible sense of the word for things like HMB, Battle of the Nations, modern reenactment type combat. And they are utterly unlike the actual surviving example. So the first thing you have to say about this sword is this only weighs the same, despite the fact that it looks hugely wide. It's incredibly thin, certainly from the second half of the blade upwards. It's incredibly flat and thin. Look, I can flex it like that. If I smack the blade, you can see how, how it'll wobble, but it is a, a absolute slicer. Okay, so yes, it is a cleaver, but it's not a cleaver because it's weighted like a, like an axe or a mace. It's not. It's not something necessarily for armoured people to just bash each other's armour with, like we might see in Battle of the Nations or something like that. That is clearly not what this weapon was made for. Because if you were going to do that, you wouldn't make an incredibly thin and sharp blade for bashing armour. You'd use a mace or you'd use a warhammer or an axe or something like this. This type of very thin and very finely edged blade is not conducive to smashing into um, helmets and it's not, I would argue, it's not really conducive to smashing into mail either. So really that's the first point I want to make, that the blades of these things are often Yes, they have inertia at the tip, and that's clearly part of um, their function, but they are not bludgeoning weapons at all. They are finely edged, slicing, uh, cleaving weapons, okay? They are not simply a bludgeoning weapon. And I have to say, a lot of the recreations of falchions for modern reenactment use are essentially just a mace in the shape of a sword, okay? They're, not, they're, they're nothing like this in terms of the blade. But there is another thing, and that's the handles, okay? So modern reenactment swords, and it has to be said sometimes hema swords as well, have a terrible tendency to have grips that are too long. Now this grip is nine centimeters long, okay? Um, now that's um, 
relatively long for, for this type of sword. And in fact, it's, it's relatively, I won't say long, but it's at the slightly upper end of the scale for Viking era swords. So let's say a nine centimeter grip, and that is perfectly enough. It is perf perfectly comfortable for me to do a simple hammer grip. And you know what? If I jam my hand up right at the end, I've got about a centimeter or more, probably a centimeter and a half spare at the bottom of there. And some people go, ah, oh, nine centimeter grip's too short. I want an 11, a 12, a 13 centimeter grip. Why? Okay, um, that is how long the originals are. If we go to the Clooney Falchion, which James Elmsley has recreated, eight centimeter grip. Okay, and as shown here, I could absolutely have an eight centimeter grip, but not only because that's what I can fit on here, but additionally, the pommel has to be seen as part of the grip. If I move my hand down to the bottom and grip this like I would hold a Viking era sword, oh look, there's at least a centimeter, probably a centimeter and a half spare at the top of that grip. Okay, so I could absolutely have an eight centimeter grip on this sword and still be able to grip it happily. And note that the pommel now becomes an edge aligning feature of the actual grip itself. Okay, so I can hold it like that. And some people go, oh, gauntlets. Well, first of all, this is a 13th century sword. Okay, in the 13th century, what gauntlets did they have? They had leather gloves with mail over the top. That, that doesn't mean that you need more space on the grip at all. Okay, your, your, your hand is what's underneath and still gripping the thing. The leather doesn't provide any more width because the, the, sorry, the Mail, the chainmail doesn't provide any more width needed on the grip because the chainmail is sitting on top of your hand, it's away from the grip. So there we go, folks. Um, a, a relatively brief look again at uh, falchions um, that are not maces, okay? They are thin, relatively light and flexible, finely edged weapons, skillfully made and with short grips. Um, not to say that all that you do absolutely find ones with long grips. If we look at the Makiowski Bible, for example, you can find long gripped sorts of weapons that some people might call falchions. You can find two-handed falchions. You can find long gripped falchions, but you don't need to have a long grip. If an original sword like the Clooney falchion has an eight centimeter grip, Use an eight centimeter grip, okay? Why not, if you're doing historical reconstruction, actually base the tools and the armor and the weapons that you're using on the historical originals. Don't just go, I know better because, because why? Because you're a medieval person, because you do some reenactment. Copy the originals and learn how the originals function and how to use them. And maybe it'll teach you something completely new and actually give you a proper insight into what the weapons of the period were actually about. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.